Now what am I going to say? Is it going to be in French or English when I greet you this evening? Well, I'll tell you what it is. I, in France, once you say bonjour to someone, you don't say bonjour or you don't greet them the rest of the day. If you see them walking around in public, you just make eye contact or, or anything but hello again. But us, when we walk into a room, we say, hi, hi. And then we leave. We may see you again later on. We go, hey, again, another time, right? But if you do that in France, they suddenly start thinking, what's, what's wrong with this guy? He's, he's not too sharp right now. That's just a little cultural lesson that I wanted to give to you this evening. But I think that there's so much more. How interested are you in culture? For me, as a missionary since 2010 in France, I got to admit, I was not so much interested in culture. At least, I didn't realize that until I ended up in a cross-cultural setting. And then all of a sudden, everything that they did was backwards for the way that I wanted to do it. And I began to look at them and think, you know what, if they would just do it this way, this life would be so much easier for them. But then I quickly learned. They would tell me things like, oh, forgive me if you, if you believe this. There's, a, there's an expression in, France, in French. It's called a con d'air. And it's, it means an air current. And so there are no air conditionings in France. And so when it gets hot, they will not open a window. You can be sweating to death. And I've done this in a hospital. They won't open up the window because there's a con d'air. And if there's a cool breeze, and what this means is this cool on there, this air current, if there is a cool breeze, it will bring sickness to you, and you will get a cold. So you got to close everything up, and you have to die of heat exhaustion. <laughs> but listen, it's for the sake of the gospel. So I learned that, right? And I begin to think, what is wrong with these people? Just roll down a window. They won't even roll down their windows in the car as they're driving when the wind comes I hope this isn't filmed. They're going to be very upset with me when I'm telling you all of their secrets. But they would roll the windows up. And you know what? I roll my window down. Of course, I'm doing this. So this was in the 1980s, right? And the air starts coming in. And I thought, I'll show them. I go in the house and suddenly I have the sniffles. And I'm bedridden for the next three days. And I'm thinking, you know, these French, they might know something. Maybe it's the air here in France. But to be a good missionary in France or to be a good mi missionary anywhere, you have to become a learner. If you're not one now, you're going to have to become one when you're in a cross-cultural setting. And when you're a learner, you will suddenly find that you become a lover of culture. Suddenly, the differences that I begin to see, I begin to have they begin to have value to me. I begin to find them interesting. And then that suddenly means that the people that I'm talking to become interesting to me. And when I'm talking to them, they suddenly realize, wait a minute, this guy really cares about what I'm saying right now. I am valued to this individual. And that's why it's one of the key characteristics of a missionary to be a learner and then a lover of culture and to see each individual as image bearers of God. This is an essential characteristic that I think that all of us should have. And I believe that, and this is where I get on my soapbox for just a moment. When I come over from France to over here, I want to encourage the American church too to become learners, to become lo lovers of culture to see each individual as image bearers of God because the nations are here. And if you want to see them sitting next to you in your church, you have to see value in them. And you have to communicate in a way that they understand, that they feel like they are heard. And then when they walk out of here, they go, you know, that person really cares for me. I believe that this is an essential characteristic that the American church needs to pick up as well. But how do we get to where we are today? How do we get where all of a sudden there's a disconnect between other cultures? 
even if they speak English, they do not understand necessarily what we're saying to them. There's communication skills that we must have, but there is also cross-cultural competencies that we must have. Did you know that all throughout the world, these different cultures put a different emphasis on their worldview? Like, for example, if you go to Asia, we see fear and power type, a type worldview where there are certain things that they are fearful of because they have power over them, whether it be evil spirits or, or whatever it is. But they're constantly living their lives with this power dynamic and the fear of the spiritual world. But then you go to other parts of the world, like the Middle East, and it's an honor and shame type culture. Or some of the things that they say and some of the things that they do is for, to preserve honor for an individual, to avoid shaming that individual. You ever heard something like that before? It's so essential in understanding these things in this cross-cultural world that we live in. But we as Americans, we tend to have a more guilt-innocent worldview. Everything is lined up in line of judgment. Everything for us is put in a courtroom. You broke the law, you're guilty, judgment is coming. You're either guilty or you're innocent. Now, yes, there is guilt and innocence in every worldview. Even someone that has an honor and, and, and power type worldview is still going to stand before a just God on the day of judgment. But just understanding that there are different ways of seeing things in the world, throughout the world, is going to help the American church become a global church and to be able to look at our neighbors and communicate to them effectively and to avoid any type of misconceptions. Like, for example, someone coming from a, an honor-shame background, they're going to avoid even shaming themselves. So if they break a plate, they'll look at that plate and, and you'll say, well, what happened? You'll say, the, the, they will say to you, the, the plate broke itself. And we as Americans, we go, you no good rotten scoundrel. That was you that broke that plate, and you're going to take responsibility for it. But all that they were really doing is avoiding shame. They know they broke the plate. And so to preserve that honor, we look past those type of things, and we end up cleaning it up. Now, what does this have to do with France? Well, I'm going to point to that in just a little bit more about the different worldviews that we enter into this world or that are present into this world. But also, let's just think about, let's talk about France real quick and the state of France. Now, they're a 1% evangelical Christian. They are a country that holds the largest Muslim population in all of Europe. And many people that go there realize that this is a very, very tough mission field because there's a fancy term for this. This is a postmodern world that we live in now. And a postmodern world means that they deny any and all absolutes. God doesn't exist. So what you believe in and what you are sharing with me is in fact a fairy tale and it has no relevance to my life. Now you remember I talk about I'm a, I'm a learner and a student of culture. And so as I'm walking around France and I'm hearing individuals tell me these things, I want to know, where did this come from? How did we get to where we are? Now, I'm not going to do a big, long lecture on how we got to postmodernism, but I can give you a brief understanding of it because I think it's essential. It's essential because you, too, live in a postmodern world. And you, too, may have already encountered sharing the gospel with your neighbor and they say that, there are no absolutes. You can believe in nothing. Nothing is true. What's good for you is what's good for you, and what's good for me is what's good for me. So how do we get there? Well, this evening, I want to blame the French. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But the French are heavily involved in this to where we are today. A small country, just smaller than the size of Texas, but has an effect on the worldview that we live in today. Because when we encounter the scriptures, you remember Acts 14 when Paul and Barnabas go to Lystra? 
and they heal the man. And all, then all of a sudden, the whole town comes up or comes out, and they begin to worship Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas turns to them and says, don't worship me, serve the God of creation, not creation. But the fact of the matter is, these people believed that Paul and Barnabas were divine. They believed in a higher power. They believed that God existed, and they believed that that God needed to be worshipped. Now, we know that that was not an easy time for evangelism because we know that by the time they made it to Derby, they were stoned and left for dead. So that doesn't mean that it was easier, but think about where they were in the culture. It was a pre-modern world that believed in absolutes. Someone was healed. God gets the credit. God must be worshipped. Paul and Barnabas going, there is one true God, the God of creation. Worship him. But then, as time goes by, and history begins to take its course, the French Revolution shows up. And in the French Revolution, the people, the peasants, storm the chateau in Versailles, which, by the way, I had the privilege of planting a church in Versailles in 2010, right next to Louis XIV's chateau. He hated Christians, particularly Protestant Christians. And so he massacred large amounts of them. But by God's grace in 2010 or 2012, we helped plant a church there. And it's still going strong today. So praise the Lord for that. But Louis XIV had children. And by Louis XVII, now the peasants are storming the chateau. Why would they do something like that? Because back in this day, the king had a divine right to rule. So in the people's minds at that time, though, he has no right to rule because there is no God. And so they storm the chateau. They remove the king from his God-given divine role. And what did they communicate? That man is the ultimate authority on earth. And then outside of Notre Dame, they removed the statue of Jesus and they replaced it with the statue of reason. And then you begin to see that this pre-modern world begins to fall apart. So people start pl placing their trust in science and, and medicine, uh, medicine and, and, and anything, reason, anything other than God, it begins to be replaced. Then we enter into a modern world where now it's anything but God, it's science and reason, it's all of the isms in this world with Nazism and communism all of these isms begin to take root because they were supposed to cure all the ills of society because God wasn't doing it. That was in the past. And when the French removed God from his throne, it was supposed to be a no-brainer at this point. But then all of the isms begin to fall with the fall of the Berlin Wall. And it begins to leave a hopelessness for the people. They tried God on Versailles. They tried science, they tried reason, they tried all the isms in the world, but it did not cure today's ills. And what, did, what was the result of that? Now we can trust in nothing. Man's messed everything up and God doesn't exist, and so who can believe in anything? To each his own from this point forward. Isn't that interesting? An interesting study of culture, and it all originates or begins to take shape in France. That's why we talk, that's why France is such a hard place to minister. Now, let me go back to this worldview and the cultures that we talked about with honor and shame and, and uh, fear and power and guilt and innocence. What does that have to do with anything? Well, as God began, as, as the belief in God began to exit France, that means that all evangelical churches, all churches began to decline heavily next to nothing. But then, by God's grace, men of God continued, you know, obviously with Calvin and, and many of the heroes of the faith originating there in Europe and in Geneva. God begins to revitalize the churches over there, and they begin to grow slowly. Slowly over time, the French are now beginning to unite. 
although they started off all scattered. But by the time I arrived in 2010, they had a, a, a French church planting organization, a French evangelical association that they've become one body. The Americans that had come there 50 years ago are suddenly handing these ministries over to the French, and they begin to lead themselves, which is ultimately what they wanted to do, and it was ultimately what we wanted to accomplish. And so we praise the Lord for that. And what I did in 2010, I began to come alongside national leaders to do the work of the ministry. Because missionaries in the past had raised them up, and so now let's come alongside of them to do the work of the ministry. But unfortunately, what happened is that those men began to pastor these churches, but they were not raising up the next generation. And we knew at that time in 2010 that most pastors were getting at that age. So we thought, well, this is a unique opportunity now for the next generation to come up, but they were not equipping the next generation. And now, in 2024, 40% of churches in France do not have a shepherd. They have no pastor to shepherd the people. So missions looks different at this point because in 2010, you had pastors. You come alongside of them to support the work, but they were never raising up leaders, and we find ourselves now having to step in. But it's a different France. We want to step in under these French associations to continue to come alongside of them, but we also want to fill the gaps that were left behind from the previous generation. And today, young people, as we encourage them to pursue pastoral ministry, they are often, what's the word for this? They're, this is often frowned upon by their families because they say, you're going to take a vow of poverty. Churches, a mega church in France is about 60 people. They're not able to pay. They're not big on giving. So these pastors are literally taking a vow of poverty as they join in for this revitalization work. So what do we need to do? This is an overwhelming aspect, right? The, the, the French people are denying any and all absolutes. They believe that God is a relic from the past. So that's a challenge. The next generation does not want to get plugged into a French church because it's a vow of poverty. And you walk into churches today without a shepherd, and do you know what that looks like? It is a sad thing. And so my wife and I begin to pray about this, and we thought, what is the solution? We can't go in and pastor every church. Maybe we could come in and revitalize a church. Those are often opportunities that we could have. But instead, what I want to do is I want to introduce to you what we believe is going to help turn around the status of the French church. I'm not saying that we're going to change the entire country. That would be a bold proclamation. But here's what we believe. My wife and I believe that planning a, a, an international church plant in the western suburbs of Paris is going to be one of the key things that, we re, that will revitalize those churches without pastors today. And that will revitalize church planning efforts throughout France. This is my family. I have six children. We'll return back after this trip. We'll return back with only three children because I have now three adult children. One's in the military in the Air National Guard. And I have two that are in college at Boyce College. One's actually going to be starting when we leave here. And then we have three younger ones, Clara, Bryce, and Emma that will be returning with us back to France. So that's a little bit about my family. Uh, Clara and Bryce were born there. Emma, she was eight months when we arrived, so this is practically home for them. But what we want to do, Dana and I, and the, our family, we want to plant what we call Cornerstone International Church of Paris in the western suburbs. There are going to be unique distinctives. Our mission is to know God and to make Him known. But our distinctives are going to be gospel-grounded, biblically distinct, spiritually gifted, 
faithfully unified, daily discipling, actively reaching. These are the distinctives that we are going to have in an international church because much like I was just telling you, the need for cross-cultural competencies and to understand other cultures and to be a learner, these are things that must be implemented in an international church. Because if we are going to reach the nations for Christ, we must understand how the nations think. We must understand where they came from. And we must understand what does it look like to make disciples from people from all over the world. And most importantly, we want them to see that the gospel, the gospel responds to every worldview, whether it be fear and power, honor and shame, or guilt and innocence. So these are the distinctives of our international church plant. But let me tell you what I'm really excited about that I think that's really going to help the churches there in France. It's our partnerships. Our partnerships, our first partnership that I want to talk about is the Pillar Network. You see that above there. The Pillar Network is a church planning organization that comes alongside and helps churches plant, or helps individuals plant churches, but it also helps in the funding. And so we believe that by planting an international church, the Pillar Network will bring more individuals in from their network to our international church where these individuals can be trained up in cross-cultural competencies, where they can gain experience in cross-cultural ministry. And then we hope to send them out to plant through the Pillar Network gospel-centered churches. French gospel-centered churches. Now, funding is always difficult. As I said, that many of them believe that they're taking a vow of poverty. We want to help fund these church planners through the Pillar Network. And that's part of what the Pillar Network does, is funds future church plants. So when I return next week to France, one of the first items that I have on my list, a to-do list, is to begin creating a pillar, a French pillar network in France. And obviously that will be tied into the pillar network that's here, and then Pillar International, which is in Scotland. The other organization that is key to, uh, uh, the other partnership that is key to this church thriving is reaching and teaching international ministries. This is my sending organization. And reaching, uh, reaching and teaching, what they do is can, they mobilize more missionaries in the local churches. Not just any missionaries, though, that, that want, have a liver quiver and all of a sudden want to go to France. But these missionaries are typically experienced missionaries with years of experience in church and pastoral ministry. And so what this means for us is that as we plant this international church, Reaching and teaching will continue to, fund, uh, to funnel in like-minded teammates to encourage us in this work, to continue to equip the people that are in this church. But at the same time, these missionaries that come to work with us will have the freedom to look at these other churches that are in need. Revitalization works are not for the faint of heart. I was involved in one. It takes a unique family unit to do so. But by having an international church where these missionaries can come and stay planted and begin to get their feet underneath them, they can calmly go and assess these churches to see, am I the right fit for this revitalization work? And this is in contrast to other organizations that say, we have a need here, we're going to fill you here, we have a need over there, let's put you over here. No, this is a landing spot to see. Where are you? What are you like in a cross-cultural setting? And what kind of environment are you going to thrive in? And reaching and teaching is continuing to funnel in, and by God's grace, we have a missionary couple coming to help us plant this church in January 25. And so we're thankful for that. Four units are going to Marseille at this point to work with uh, a, a unit that we have there in Marseille. But I project that more and more missionaries, as they figure out that we're there and that they figure out that we have a church in Paris, more and more missionaries are going to come into Paris, which means more and more missionaries can revitalize the churches. More and more missionaries can join the Pillar Network and begin planting churches 
there in France. Another one that you want to see there on the bottom part of the slide there is the Kenef, Rizofef, and Action Biblique. These are French church planning or French church associations. Dana and I were in a French church for, uh, for eight years. Afterwards, we helped plant an international church in the heart of Paris, and that's where we began to, to gain international church planning experience. So what we want to do is we want to take the knowledge that we've obtained and the relationships that we have attained, and we want this church to be a part of the French Association. We don't want to separate from what the French are already organized and what they are wanting to do. And so we are coming alongside and having key partnerships with French associations so that we can better bless the French church as well and be a part of the solution together, not something on our own, but with the French people. And finally, these church partnerships, as I've already mentioned, are going to bring in more teammates. They're going to raise up more French pastors. We're going to have summer practicums through reaching and teaching where those that graduate from seminary and they want cross-cultural experience will come and this will be a hub for them for the summer to gain cross-cultural experience. We hope to lead internships where we bring pastors in to gain more experience and to assess if this is what the Lord is calling them to do because it's not for everybody. But most importantly, we want this church to be a hub where we can send out more church planners where the gospel will continue to go forth in France. This is the ultimate vision that we have. And that's why at the bottom there, we'd always encourage anyone that wants to be involved in what we're doing to partner with us. Financially is one of the ways that you can do that, and that's what that QR code is for. But also, as you leave here, I encourage you to grab a, a prayer card as well. We covet your prayers during this time. France is not an easy place to minister. And I talked to many of you after the service who have been there or who know people who have been there and have noted the challenges that we have. And church, we need your prayers. I'm so thankful for pa Pastor Chase inviting us over here because what I'm hoping to do by being before you here and sharing more about the work here in Fr uh, there in France is we are trying to develop what the scriptures call a partnership in the gospel. I would like to get to know each one of you better. I would like to continue to come and visit and share with you the work that God is doing in France. I'd like to continue to communicate to you on a monthly basis on how you could pray for us and encourage us along with the work. And who knows, Lord willing, some of you might be able to come to France to help us with this church plant. But overall, I want you to see what we're doing is a partnership. We are in this together. Some people go. Some people pray. Some people send. But all of it is a partnership in the gospel. Please believe that. And if you would like to partner with us in some way, I encourage you to sign up for our newsletter list, our, our newsletter. And we'll have a list at the, at the back here where our prayer cards are. Just sign up. Just your email address is enough and maybe your name. And then once a month or every other month, I'll share with you how the Lord's working over there and how he's working on this church plant right here and how you could pray for us and maybe join in on what we're doing. But I want to thank Pastor Chase and his family for bringing me here. This was well worth the trip. You guys have been so warm and inviting and, and so encouraging to me that I told Pastor Chase that I'm going to come back regardless if I get an invitation or not. <laughs> but thank you for having me, and, and would you pray with me, please? Father in heaven, it was long ago that you put the nations on my heart, and I just didn't know how it was going to work out. But I am so thankful, Lord, for the opportunity to share how you are working in my family and through my family and, and what you're doing in France. And I pray, Lord, that, that this church cultivates a, an even greater love for missions, and particularly a love in France. 
a desire to see the gospel go forth there, a desire to see churches continue to grow, and a desire to uh, learn more about how you are working on a global scale in general. And if that's what it takes here, Lord, just talking about France for others to think about where you might have them throughout the world and where they might be involved in local missions, then so be it. And I praise you for that. I thank you, Lord, for the partnerships that we have in the gospel. And I pray, Lord, that this relationship continues to develop for your glory, I pray. It's in Christ's name. Amen.